Um, so we're going to move into the final set of talks um, for um, today and there's been it has come up a number of times about the importance of um, culture um, and also how you go about hiring the right caliber of people to join your business and accelerate growth. So uh, this talk's titled around how to hire on board, coach and develop successful sales teams. Um, so there's going to be a, a number of um, short talks and then it will go into a panel. After that panel, we will do the announcements of the um, top 50 UK SaaS companies to work for and the top 10 will collect their award. Just as a raise of hands, because um, we're organising the pizzas and the tab, um, who, who's actually coming down for a drink afterwards? Okay, did you get that? About? Okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> this bar's going to go on for a long time. Um, okay, so just to give the speakers a running order, um, uh, Jennifer, you're going to be up first. Um, then we've got Pat Trainer, And then if actually we can go to Dimitar. And then if um, Jackie and, and Colleen can come up, we're going to seat, seat you. And then we can bring the rest of the chairs up for the final panel. Okay, cool. Um, so Jennifer has spoken at one of our previous um, sales confidence events at Salesforce Tower. Um, and she's doing some amazing things um, with a UK founded company on Fido. So let's invite Jennifer up. Round of applause, come on. Let's keep up the energy. Thank you. Um, so I was trying to figure out how I deliver how to hire, onboard, and train in 10 minutes. And the reality is I couldn't figure out how to squish all of that into 10 minutes. So I'm going to actually probably be less than 10 minutes and just focus on something really actionable in terms of hiring. Um, so how many people here have hired somebody that you loved, you had an awesome conversation, and you were so excited, and they just didn't work out, and you knew it from day one? OK, almost everybody. How many people weren't really sure about somebody that you hired, and it turned out that they were OK? They, had, they ended up doing OK. It's not an exact science, right? So one of the things that I would advise is have a framework of what you're looking for. Because if you go in, and I see this often, a lot of times people will interview and they'll have a gut feel. They'll have a gut feel about somebody, but there's no framework. And that's oftentimes when it doesn't always work out. And sometimes the gut feel is, is great, but you, you almost probably have in your mind and don't realize a couple key things you're looking for. And so what I always, and in line with what Ren was talking about and Michael, what I always think about is what I want to do is bring in people and hire them and coach them to make them absolutely poachable. I want my guys, I want reps, I want recruiters calling them all the time because that means they're really good. It means they're doing really well, but it's my job to create an environment where they don't want to go. And it's my job to make sure that they're always learning and they have no interest in leaving. And so to do that, there are four things. What I'm going to talk about is um, I have four kind of competencies, I guess is the word you can use, um, or four, four things that I look for, and then four fundamental, non-negotiable um, qualities as a person. And this is true as a rep, or this is true at, it really in any role. So I'm actually going to go in the reverse order of what I was thinking I was going to talk about. Um, the four things that are absolutely 100% non-negotiable, the first is they have to be coachable. If I hire somebody, even with a lot of experience, and this is how they do it, and it's not going to change, they're not going to fit in because there's lots of ways of doing things. And we, and we at Enfido have our ways of doing things. And you know what? If you're, if you're never going to change, that means you're not going to grow and you don't have that fundamental curiosity to get better. So the first thing, non-negotiable, non-negotiable is they're coachable. And the second is they're hungry, right? I don't want somebody who's going to leave at 5 o'clock and that's when they're done. And I recognize that my team has a life, right? Like I have no interest in bugging them on a weekend. I want them to have a life because that means when they're in the office and when they're working, they're really working hard. But they've got to be hungry. They've got to be willing to make that extra phone call. They've got to be willing to pick up the phone. They've got to be willing to send that extra email. I mean, I'm so lucky. I have the best team and they're so hungry and they're great. Um, so coachable, hungry, intelligent. It's somebody who you know that they're going to be able to synthesize a lot of information and be able to translate what might be a very technical discussion into a business value. 
Because if all we're doing is talking about features and technology, we're not solving a problem for our customers. So they've got to be intelligent. And intelligent means emotional intelligence. They know how to push. They know when to back off. They know how to um, grow. They know where to learn. They're, 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 they, they have that, in, that innate intelligence. And the last one, and this is absolutely fundamental, is they've got to be ethical. Because they're not only representing themselves, they're representing on Fido. And it's really not hard to sell anybody something once. And you know what? It's really, really, really hard to sell somebody something twice if you screwed them the first time. And it's really, really hard for their colleagues to sell something because word gets around. Don't, I mean, everybody talks. I know that our, our customers all talk to each other. And they know. And the, the best thing that I've ever done as a, when I was an individual contributor was I would tell prospects, you're not ready for me. Like, I, I'm too much for you in some cases. Here's some flags to look at. When you hit these thresholds, when you start seeing this happening in your business, call me. In the meantime, here's a couple competitors who I think are probably better for you, to be honest, right now. There was not one single time that when a, com a customer hit that threshold, they didn't call me. Or when they went to a new company, they called me. And so it's just because it's ethical, right? I, want, I genuinely wanted to solve their problems. So four things, coachable, hungry, intelligent, and ethical. If any one of those four aren't there, I, I, can't, I can't see a reason to bring them on. And that's just to, fair, to be fair to them, and it's to be fair to the company. I mean, we're bringing people on to be ambassadors of the company, and that's really, really critical. So then, what I do when I'm looking for reps is I kind of have four framework foundational qualities that are, that are critical. Um, one, and this is specifically to sales, is they have the ability to prospect and build a pipeline. Because if they're going to just sit back and wait for somebody else to tee everything up, and to be honest, we do have an awesome, we have SDRs who are doing that, but if, if that's all they're going to do, they're probably not hungry, um, and they're probably not going to be able to then build that pipeline in the best way. So I have a list of core things, and I'm happy to share my list with people if they want. Um, generate um, pipeline, focus on value versus features. Um, just different things that I look for, and I ask questions ab around this. And what's really important is when you're asking questions in an interview is you don't say things like, um, do you share success? What person is going to say no, right? They're all going to be, yeah. So what I do instead is I'll ask questions like, tell me about a time. Tell me about a time, tell me about the best, biggest deal that you've closed. And I listen for, do they talk about creating value? Do they talk about their colleagues? Because nobody ever wins a deal on their own. As much as sales reps like to think they do, the good sales reps know that it's not them. They just happen to be the one that's, that's le leading. But there's a huge amount of people behind them that are putting in blood, sweat, and tears oftentimes, and that are doing the really late nights um, with them or for them. So do they share success? Also, tell me about a time you lost a deal. That's actually really interesting to find out, do they take responsibility? Do they blame others? Do they learn from it? It's, again, testing the intelligence, the emotional intelligence, their they're smarts, and just do they have that, that ethics, right? If you blame everybody else every time you lose a deal, we've all lost deals and it sucks, but if you can't learn from it and you don't understand what happens, you're just gonna keep, keep doing it and they're gonna end up throwing somebody under the bus and it's not gonna be fun. So um, ability to prospect and build pipeline is one. Um, ability to close deals, obviously we're hiring sales reps, we wanna make sure that we can get people who can close. Um, by doing that, I always ask, tell me about the last four quarters what was your number? A really good rep will know to the cent, pretty much, what they did. They will know to the percent what they did. I can tell you for the last eight years what I've done. Um, they will know if it's an annual quota, tell me about the last two years. What have you done? Where, you know, how long did it take you to hit your number? Because the really good sales reps, they know this because it, it feeds them, right? So I ask that. I ask things like, um, how do you align with customer, you know, the customer pains? Tell me about how you solved a problem. Because if they can't tell you how they're solving a problem, they're not going to close deals. They're just going to be there talking about features and functionality for like ever. And you can, you're going to get, I mean, they're going to have lots of awesome conversations that get absolutely nowhere. Um, the third one I look is if they're able to impact the business proactively. And that's really important because we're a fast growing company. We don't have time for people to sit back and be told what to do and then go do it. 
can they take some calculated risks? You know, I ask them about, tell me about the bi biggest risk you took in your career. Tell me about the big biggest risk you took in life. And it's really interesting to see what people have to say because oftentimes you realize that somebody who might come off maybe a little bit tentative actually has a spine of steel. And you know that they're gonna take calculated. I mean, you don't want somebody going off and you know, go going, going crazy. But you know that somebody who is, is willing to be really proactive about things or recommend ways to change. Because I learn from my team every day. I'm extraordinarily fortunate that I have a great team who, quite frankly, I learn from myself every day. And it's because they're not afraid to take risks and they're not afraid to try things and they're not afraid to be proactive. So that's um, the third. And then the last is, do they have these really good just foundations? Are they gonna be a great um, addition to the company? Do they have a track record of success? Are they curious? Do they wanna learn new things? Are they ambitious? Um, do they, are they proactive? Are they resilient? You know, I always ask, ask about, you know, tell me how a customer, tell me about a time a customer said no. How did you turn, around, turn that around? Because it's really interesting, we've all been told no, and usually those end up being the biggest, best deals because you were able to actually come and think of it and be able to reframe the problem and change the, change the customer's mind. So I guess just to summarize, again, somebody who is coachable, who's hungry, who's intelligent and ethical, and then I have four key things that I'm looking for in anybody in terms of as a sales rep, and I've got questions asked, and I use the tell me about a time when, because that way, rather than asking something yes or no, Somebody's, somebody, if you ask a question outright, they'll know exactly what you're looking for. There's, these are sales reps, right? They'll know exactly what you're looking for and they're gonna answer exactly how you want them to. But if you ask them to share a story, thanks, Ren. If you ask them to share a story, oftentimes they give away a lot more and it's oftentimes a really delightful surprise when they share these stories and you realize that they actually solved something in a really creative way. And they're really excited about working with their colleagues or quite frankly, there's some humongous red flags that they don't even realize they're giving away. And if you know how to ask the questions in the right way, oftentimes you're able to weed out the people who aren't gonna work in the first place. So that, that's what I look for in hiring. Thank you, Jennifer. Up next, wait. Um, I've had a good pleasure of working with Pat at LinkedIn and he's definitely um, a wise owl. Um, he's the go-to man for everyone in the business whenever you need advice and I highly recommend um, spending some time with him this evening. So Pat, come on up. Thanks James, kind words. Um, so I'm here to share with you uh, my two top tips on the topic of uh, coaching. Now, as some of you may know, coaching is a lot like teenage sex. Everybody says they're doing it loads and they're great at it. It's true. But you may worry that the person you're coaching is not getting a great deal from the experience. Well, there is another way. So my name is Patrick Trainer. I'm gonna share with you two of my coaching tips um, on two specific situations. Pipeline reviews and leadership development. So pipeline reviews can be repetitive and frustrating, but this first tip will add new life to the experience. Leadership development can seem like a big task. The second tip will free up your time. Um, yeah, that's what it'll do. <laughs> um, so uh, I perfected these tips uh, leading LinkedIn's new business team and also with the startups I consult for today. So if you're a founder with limited sales experience or a sales leader short on time or an individual contributor looking to move into leadership responsibilities, then I'm hoping these are practical tips that you can implement immediately. So tip number one, uh, pipeline reviews. Who hasn't sat in a pipeline review and thought this is repetitive and boring? You want to impart some wisdom to your reps and help them close their deals, right? But too often, we fall into a common trap, which is we get the team together, we race through every pipeline every week with a veneer of information, and well, you just figure it'll be useful for everybody to listen to the discussion. It just doesn't work. 
First of all, you probably need to separate forecasting from pipeline reviews, but that's a whole separate subject. The big problem with pipeline reviews is you're trying to give an insightful piece of advice to a rep who probably knows a lot more about the deal than you do and who's probably already tried half the ideas you're going to come up with. So to avoid this battle, I use something that I call the foresight question. It's dead simple. The foresight question simply asks the rep to imagine that it's three months in the future and the deal has died. So let's give this a try. Can you all think of a deal that you're currently working on or your team's working on right now? Everybody got one? Okay, now imagine it's three months in the future, it's September. You've tried everything to close the deal, but it hasn't worked. You've lost the deal, the deal is dead. We meet in September and I ask you, tell me, what went wrong with the deal and what could you have done differently? The answers I've heard are incredibly revealing and equally empowering. Faced with this question, reps seem to suddenly know immediately what it was that was going to mess up their deal. Um, but the, 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 the challenge here is that, uh, sorry, the challenge here is that despite actually knowing the information, they've done nothing with it. They've ignored it. They haven't challenged, uh, they haven't challenged the, the threat to their deal. They've, they've basically just relied on hope. And as we know, hope is not a strategy. So now that you know the true threat to the deal, you can do something about it. Or rather, you can coach your rep on what they can do about it. And so that's the, let me just, sorry. And so, and so now that they've re revealed the true threat, you can do something about it. Um, and this technique also helps reps to put themselves in the shoes of the customer. And what I've also felt, found over time is that reps will start to think a lot more about how the customer buys from them rather than how they sell to the customer. So that's the fourth site question. It's my top tip for creating coaching opportunities in pipeline reviews. For leadership development, this can seem like a big task, and you may not have big resources. But if you don't create opportunities for your reps to develop leadership skills, many of your best reps are going to leave. So what I found was a simple solution that gave my team a taste of practical leadership that encouraged the best performers to stick around and inspire the whole team. My solution for creating coaching opportunities within leadership development was to create a rotating team leader program. What does that mean? Well, it simply meant that somebody from my team prepared and ran the sales meeting. So every week, they gathered some sales metrics, created a presentation, invited somebody from another part of the business, and facilitated a discussion on a particular aspect of our uh, sales proposition. Um, so what this did was it created a platform for my team leader to be seen to be leading. It was a safe space for them to experiment and a place where I could support them closely. So for all of this extra, for all of this extra work, which was really my job, the team leader got no official recognition of their responsibilities. They got no pay rise, they got no reduction in their quota, and after a few months, well, the role would end. So as you can imagine, there was a bit of resistance to begin with. However, the team recognized that this was an opportunity to demonstrate potential, and at the very least, it might help them decide whether their career path lay in leadership or as an individual contributor. So my role in this was to coach the team leader. But here's a secret. 
I wasn't coaching them on how to run a sales meeting. It was all the other leadership opportunities, all the other practical leadership situations that developed around that. So I found myself coaching them on things such as how to handle different personality types through to what are our HR policies, from things like working with cross-functional teams um, to uh, how to run projects to a deadline. And then loads of practical stuff, like how do I create bespoke reports in our CRM and how does our forecasting model actually work because they've never really paid attention. And down to other stuff, really practical stuff that made them look good, such as how do I get the video conference equipment to work. And it was through this program that I realized that some members of the team had leadership abilities that hadn't previously been visible. And for other people in the team, a career as an individual contributor was going to be the best path for them. Another thing I noted was that some, not all, but some of the women in my team underestimated their leadership potential, whereas most of the men overestimated theirs. Another truth is that if you've built a really strong successor to you, it's far easier for you to take on greater responsibilities yourself. Ultimately, the program helped some of my team land leadership roles, and it's one of the initiatives I look back on most fondly. So now that I've shared with you my two top tips for coaching, the next time you find yourself in a pipeline review, I want you to try the foresight question, so you too can identify the true threats to your deals so you can take action on them now. And with leadership development, I encourage you to find a platform uh, to allow leadership to flourish and to free up the sales leader's time to focus on more impactful activities than just running sales meetings. And then, when somebody asks you about coaching, you'll be able to tell them, yeah, you do it loads and you're great at it. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Thank you, Pat. Um, so we're now going to hand over to uh, Dimitar, um, who's had a very successful career, um, as you heard earlier from Ben, was the first was high at Stack Overflow, um, and now CEO, founder of his own business. Over to you. Thank you. How are you guys doing? You good? Tired? It's been a long day, I understand, so uh, I'll try to keep it super, super short. Um, before we start, I actually do have a confession to make. I'm going to go totally off script. Um, so I was planning to talk about um, coaching and sales development in particular, and how to leverage the wisdom of crowds, how to basically leverage the combined knowledge that exists in your sales team in order to achieve that hockey, mysterious hockey curve that everyone uh, talks about. Um, I did a very similar talk, however, last week at SAS, that was one of the keynotes there, and I bumped into Greg right here, who happened to be there, and he confronted me with it. He said, are you going to be giving the same speech that you did at SASTA? which I was about to do. So uh, what I'm going to do is keep it very short and sweet and actually talk about interviewing, which uh, Jennifer touched upon. So I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about how Stack Overflow um, approached interviewing and hiring salespeople in particular. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because we had one of the lowest attrition rates in sales uh, in the SaaS world that I'm aware of. I don't know, I actually have to admit I missed Ben's presentation earlier, so I don't know if he touched upon it. Um, but just to kind of set the tone here, the average for uh, an insight SaaS sales team, inside sales, outbound sales, SaaS sales team is around 34% attrition rate, uh, which a lot of our sales leaders here will just shrug your shoulders and say, well, that's, that's how it is, you have to deal with it. Um, at Stack Overflow, we only had 1%. Here in Europe, for the five years that I was managing the team, it was only 1%, and it was a fairly large sales organization as well. So I joined, as James said, uh, as the first European hire, and by the time I left, we had 80 people, 45, uh, give or take, of them in sales. Um, 
a lot of that very low attrition rate, I think, was accomplished by design. A lot of the things that I spoke about uh, in, in Sustain Paris, um, but a lot of it was basically a very, very uh, strict uh, interviewing process that we followed. And I, I'd very quickly like to share that with you and just leave it with that. It's, it's very simple. Um, it's something that the, the founder of Stack Overflow, Joel Spolsky, uh, actually uh, introduced to the company. Uh, his hiring approach is known as smart and get things done. Simple as that. So basically what uh, uh, Joe always said, regardless of whether you're hiring for salespeople, engineers, no matter what function in the organization, you want to basically make sure that the candidate can do two things. Number one, they're smart. Number two, they get shit done. Simple as that. And the way the way Stack Overflow approached it is basically to have a very binary sales process that had at least six interviews, which sounds crazy. And you know, if you're in a fast-growing SaaS sales organization, you definitely don't have necessarily time to be doing all those interviews, especially with candidates who are really hot and they have multiple offers on the table. We did do it, however, and it panned out really well for us. As I said, attrition rate is one percent. So how did that look like? Um, first thing first, the um, First, the very first interview that we did was actually with the hiring manager, which is normally the very last interview, and it's kind of counterintuitive, uh, but that really worked well. So um, that would be basically the interview with me here in Europe um, for a very long time, and then people like Ben and, and so forth. But um, what we basically looked uh, in that particular interview for was, can that person get the, the job? The, are they getting things done? Um, and Jennifer gave you a lot of things that you can ask, and I think every, every business is different. The things that really mattered for us um, was basically if that particular person can fit within our deal size, because in the early days, I understand Ben talk about how we transitioned into enterprise sales, but in the early days, what Stack Overflow did was fairly transactional and high volume. So one of the things that we always wanted to make sure um, any candidate talking to us could do is basically keep up the pace and the volume. So, you know, we, there were a lot of questions around deal size, uh, sales cycle duration, could you actually adjust to the high velocity that we were selling at? Um, so that was kind of my, my part, and just making sure, as I said, that people can get shit done. Um, from there on, we would have um, what ended up being two separate interviews. We called them Guide A and Guide B. And this was basically a result of all the uh, executive team getting together and deciding what really mattered for us as an organization in terms of uh, interpersonal skills and traits. Uh, and we identified eight Stack Overflow. I'm not going to go through all of them. In fact, I'm not going to share any of them because I said, what matters to us is probably very different to what matters to you as a business. Uh, but we created two separate interviews, four competencies in one of them, four competencies in the other. They were conducted by um, different people, um, and they also f follow the same interview questions, more or less. Um, the point behind this was that we have a very structured interview process, so we avoid this bias where our gut feel tells us this candidate is great, and we always have the same conversation, and we can compare likes for likes, which kind of sounds very obvious, but I think very often we fall into the same trap, which is to... And I think Nazma mentioned it, um, her and her CEO going through this right now, where the CEO likes someone, Nazma is not sure, we'll make a compromise. So the beauty of what we did at Stack was the, uh, the fact that um, should anyone uh, throughout this process, and I'm going to continue in a second with the rest of the journey, said no, no hire, that candidate, no matter how much I may have liked him during the first interview, did not get to, um, to, to get hired. Um, so once you've done uh, Guide A and Guide B, we would basically go into uh, a team lunch, um, so we, we served hot food uh, every single day. So anyone who's interviewing with us would come and have lunch with us. And that was basically an opportunity uh, to assess company culture and company f uh, fit. But not so much from our standpoint, more from the, uh, the standpoint of the candidate, just to kind of give them an opportunity to see what they're really uh, signing up for. You know, because very often as a sales leader, you can sell the job opportunity and then actually what's, what you're signing up for is very different. So being able to talk to your peers, Invaluable. So, but at that point as well, if anyone out of the three people that you're having lunch with said no, no luck. That candidate was not going to make it until the end of uh, that hiring process. Uh, all throughout these interviews, uh, you're basically making detailed notes, which are uh, which are not shared with anyone. They're they're stored in our ATS, but no one looks at them up until the very last interview, which we're coming on to now, which is what we called as appropriate, and that would be most uh, often than not the chief operating officer of the business who would go through all the notes, reads. Uh, read through them and try to identify if there are any, any red flags. And then they will have an open conversation with the candidate, not a structured interview, and try to poke around any of those critical areas that may or may not have been flagged up. And at that point, if that's a yes, we would actually make an offer. Um, but as I said, higher, no higher, up until that point. So that's it. I'm just going to leave it here. And hopefully we can talk about other things during the, the panel. Thank you very much. Right, so we've got two lovely ladies um, coming on up. 
from DocuSign. And then uh, we're going to the panel before the awards. Um, Jackie actually spoke at our Level 39 event in January, um, and we had exceptional feedback, so I thought I'd invite her along again. And um, as such, she felt that it was a team effort, her success, and so she's brought her colleague along. So I'm curious how this one plays out. Okay, well, hopefully it will play out very well. Um, so, yeah, thanks, James. Um, as James said, I spoke at an event back in January, um, and I was talking about building and scaling sales teams. Um, we've, um, if anyone's familiar with DocuSign, we've experienced incredible growth. Um, I've been with the company for just over um, three years, and during that time, my team has um, increased fivefold. Um, and just to give you another little bit of context on the, the scale of growth that we've seen, in Dublin, when I joined, there were three individuals. There wasn't even an office. Um, the first hire that my VP made was actually Carleen's boss, our EMEA head of recruitment. Uh, so that shows you how much emphasis we place on recruitment and having great alignment with uh, the sales leaders and the recruiters at DocuSign. So three people three years ago. We're now over 200 people um, in Dublin. And then we have other operations um, across EMEA. So that gives you a, a sense of how much hiring um, has been done during that period. Um, so one of the key things that I talked about at the event at Canary Wharf was how Carleen and I have um, really, really great alignment. Um, in the very early days, three years ago, we sat down um, over drinks one evening and developed a blueprint of the type of sales professionals that we were looking to hire. And obviously, you know, there were sales aptitudes that were really important, but it was incredibly important to us um, that we were hiring the right people that were the best possible possible cultural fit for us as well. And I think one of the speakers earlier talked about the DNA of the early joiners um, to an organization or to an international um, operation. And that was something that we were really mindful of. So after the event, I had lots of emails and lots of questions coming through. And the constant theme was that people had been really taken aback by how much alignment we have and how closely we were collaborating. And I was really, really surprised by that. Um, I certainly don't take Carleen and the team for granted at all, um, but I guess I just assumed that everybody else had enjoyed that level of collaboration with their recruiters, whether they were internal or external, and the question showed me that actually that really wasn't the case. So, when James asked me if I'd be interested in speaking today, I thought, what would be better than for everyone to have a chance to meet Colleen and to hear, in her words, some of the initiatives that we've put in place that have helped us to streamline the recruitment process, make sure that we're attracting and then retaining the very best possible candidates. So, over to you, Colleen. So, um, in terms of, of DocuSign, so I, as Jackie mentioned, I've been in DocuSign up, coming up to three years, and boy, it has been a whirlwind of a growth journey. And when I first started, as Jackie mentioned, our, our first hire was really Saul Witten. He was the director of recruiting. So, it was just me and him with the mammoth task of building on commercial sales. So, that was from sales development, account executive, right up to customer success. And within that, in terms of building a talent program, the three areas that I want to talk to you about is really understanding what you're hiring for, how are you going to build that candidate pipeline, and how are you going to test for those top performers. And if we look at the, the start of any talent program, it's really about understanding. Understand what it is that you are hiring for, what it is that they're going to be doing in the role, what are the skills that you're looking for, but what does success look like for you in that position? And that's really in terms of meeting with Jackie, meeting with all of the other leaders, and really with them, really brainstorming on what are the core competencies that we want in these roles across commercial sales. So we redefined and we redefined again, and we agreed on eight core competencies. And with those eight core competencies, we then took them, we put them into our ATS, we use Greenhouse internally, and with that, really what that did for us was Every hiring manager then scored against each of these competencies at every single interview stage. And with that, it really gave us standardization across all roles, across all offices. It also gave clarity to every single hiring manager. And for us, it really raised the candidate bar as well. So now that you understand what you're looking for, the second part is, how are you going to build candidate pipeline? And in terms of building that candidate pipeline, our ATS will link into Glassdoor, it links into Indeed, and it also links into LinkedIn. Now, if I want to share with you last quarter in terms of the source of hire for us, 
and really where those candidates came from. So 38% of our hires came from employee referral. So that's people in the business referring anybody. 36% came from recruiter sourced, which is me and the team actually going out onto LinkedIn recruiter and actively building that pipeline. 11% came from direct in that they've come through the job boards, that they've come through LinkedIn. 10% came from a sourcer, so we have a dedicated sourcer in our team that will be actively driving pipeline. And less than 5% came from agency. So that can really show you that the 38% that was coming from the employee referral is definitely a, a key area for you to tap into. And for me, it's probably one of the most single points that you need to have in your recruiter toolkit. And with that, with the employee referral, I feel that within DocuSign, for us specifically, it has given us a, a higher quality hire. We feel that they ramp up much more quickly, that they perform better, and they stay longer. And with that, they obviously have that embedded relationship with the person that they have internally. Um, two other initiatives that I want to share with you that we rolled out last quarter to drive more candidate pipeline for us was one really simple idea in actually getting your senior leaders to send out some sort of communication to their actual team. And that's as simple as me actually going and writing a short blurb of, this is the open role that we have, here is the link, and actually sending it to leaders like Jackie um, to really push out into their uh, networks as well. So instead of me coming and actively banging the recruiting drum, it's the credibility coming from the, the leaders. And that was really successful for us. Another key initiative that we drove around six weeks ago that cost 10 pizzas and give us four hires was a lunch and learn session. And a lunch and learn is really inviting all of your staff to a canteen area with 10 pizzas, inviting them to bring their laptops along, and really with me going up there and educating them on here are our open roles and these, this is what the roles are. Again, they're coming from different companies that have a different meaning for account manager or pre-sales or solutions consulting. So really giving them a sense of this is what our top roles are um, and then from there, sitting with them and looking through their networks as well. And that again was super successful and we got four conversions in terms of hires for, for that area. So now that you've got your, your pipeline, how are you going to test if they are top performers? Um, and for us, in terms of, of testing for, for top performers, we have two initiatives that we have been using probably for the last year um, that really, for us, has really drove the candidate bar. Uh, the first area that we have is a predictive index test. So the predictive index test is an online behavioral test that we send candidates very early on in the interview process. And it's a, an online behavioral tool that takes four minutes and really assesses what they're like in the workplace. So for us, it's not a, a no or a yes or a no in terms of failing. Um, there's no pass or fail as such. And for us, it really enables us to make better informed decisions, whether that be testing further in interviews in terms of competencies, but also in terms of the onboarding of them as well um, for that. The second area that we uh, rolled out was a discovery or role play call. Um, the discovery or role play call was something that we introduced and that was really born out of me meeting with the hiring team and saying, how can we tighten the recruiting funnel even further and how can we really have a higher candidate bar in terms of what we have. And really asking the leaders and asking them, okay, what, what is it, what is the one trait that makes your top performers top performers? And the common thread that came out of everything was they do a really deep discovery, Carleen. They do a really thorough discovery. Um, and that for us was something that was a, an area that I said, well, why aren't we testing this in our interview stage? So we then introduced that into our on-site interview stage from sales development right up to uh, a kind executive for a major level. And with that, ahead of their interview, they are given a brief. That brief is, this is a customer of DocuSigns. This is what you've been passed from the sales developer. Here are the key areas that they've tested. Uh, this is what they're looking for in terms of the, the competitor. And then in that on-site interview, Jackie and another hire manager will then act as the CEO or the CEO 
um, and really go further and deeper in terms of, of qualifying them. And for us, the di discovery, what it's really given us and enabled us to do is obviously make more informed decisions, but it's definitely raised the candidate bar, but also allowed us to look outside of the norm of not just looking at SaaS individuals and really looking at people that come from different backgrounds. But we've also seen a higher conversion rate on once they've come on board, once they've been onboarded, and once they go to do their sales certification, that we've seen a higher conversion in terms of people passing that test. So in terms of building your talent program, it's really about understanding what it is that you're looking for, what are those core competencies. Again, it's about building your candidate pipeline and looking at different initiatives internally with your employee referral, and again, about how you're going to test for top performers. Thanks, Carleen. And I can't stress um, how valuable the discovery um, screening uh, test has been. Um, we've had candidates that we've, you know, literally fallen in love with. We thought this is a fantastic um, sales professional. They've come with, you know, really, really good experience and credentials and references and so on. We've run the discovery call and, you know, they've just bombed. Uh, they just haven't really done a good job of it. And I think it, to pick up on one of the points from the sessions this morning, um, for us, it's really important that RAE can have a conversation with the customer, um, that they can really dig into the business, not just the immediate use case, um, because that's when DocuSign has the ability not just to land, but to expand. And what we've found is that some AEs are you know, great at qualification, but they're not capable of having that high-level business conversation, which is going to build a long-term relationship with the customer and enable us to really realise the full value um, of that customer. So I was going to dig into a few other things, but I just want to really... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, reinforce that point. Um, just to leave you with some stats, I guess, um, you know, we've really been able to streamline um, our recruitment process. I don't do any telephone interviews. If Carleen suggests that I should interview someone, I interview them because I know based on everything that she's just talked about that that candidate is going to be a really good fix. So we've immediately eliminated one step of the process there. Um, we've been able to hire over 30 candidates just for the UK sales teams um, in the last three years. The vast majority have been personally um, handled by Carleen. Um, of those, we've had two attrition, um, so very, very low. Um, I should um, highlight that they were each with us for about 18 months and made a really valuable contribution in that time, so kind of no regrets there whatsoever. And then I guess more importantly, and this is something that Carleen really focuses on and prides herself on and tracks, um, eight of those, um, of those 30 um, have gone on to be promoted, um, maybe twice for a couple of those candidates, actually. Um, and that's something we're really proud of. So very low attrition, very high promotion rate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was really insightful. Um, just, I'm getting a sense that we're, we're getting a little bit um, shaky, and I want us to get into the final panel. Just put your hand up if you'd like £500. Not many of you putting your hand up. We're obviously very successful sales leaders and founders. So I have got a quick competition for you. Um, we're going to create £500 of value just while we're setting up the panel. Um, so as you're aware, that this was the first year for SAS growth, and we're going to be doing it again next year um, and you'll be able to get um, tickets for £99. So I'm going to give away five tickets but you all have to stand up. So can everybody stand up please? Shake your legs. Has anybody got a pound coin? A pound coin? 50p? Does anybody carry cash? A pound? No, literally. Here we go. Good man. Right, so we're going to do heads and tails, okay? It's a very simple game. You have to choose between heads or tails, okay? So no cheating. Look at your peers. And the winner will get five free tickets for SAS Growth 2019. So we're going to... Do you mind doing the honours, flicking the coin? Okay, <laughs> and you can tell us what it's going to be. Okay, so pick heads or tails. Heads or tails? Get involved at the back, good. Heads or tails? No cheating. Okay. What is it? Tails. Tails. Tails stay standing. Okay. Those with tails, look around at each other. It's getting competitive now. So either heads, not many heads, anyone heads? Guys, it's 50-50. 
Oh, some people change their minds. Easily influenced. And tails. We've got a few heads and tails. Okay, what have we got? Tails again. Tails again. Sit down if you're a tails. Okay. All right, so heads or tails? Look around. Heads or tails over there, Richard. Good man. We've got heads right at the back. Are you cheating, mate? No, okay. All right, heads or tails? It's heads again. Stay standing if you're heads. All right. Heads or tails? Make a decision. There was a few swaps. Heads again. Heads again. Okay. How many have we got? Are you still in? Okay. Um, all right. Heads or, who else is in? That's two. Okay. We've got five of you. Right. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And you're doing heads. So can you split between heads or tails? Tails. Tails. Who's still remaining? Do you want, where, where? Okay, do you want to come up to the stage? Come on, quick, come on. Everyone, let's go, 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 Right. Who have we got? Come up to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen. What's your name? Will you please put your Michael from Sticky World. Michael from Sticky World. Who's up next? Look, it's like actually Butlins. Who's up next? Sophie from Benetrix. Thank you, Sophie. Sam from Aqualinks. Okay, Sam from Aqualinks. All right, okay, this is intense. Wait, no, stay on the stage, mate. Okay, right, right. Are you, well, hold on, hold on. Uh, what have we got at the end? Staying in tail, that's you. Tails? Are you heads or, ta heads or tails? Oh, okay. Are you ready? Heads or tails? It's heads. It's heads. Thank you. Cheers, Sophie. Right, two gentlemen here into the middle. This is getting really intense now. Basically, who's going to be heads or tails? It's 50-50. Right, okay. So the winner is going to get five free tickets, 500 pounds of value, right here. What is it, ladies? It's this guy. Oh, we have a champion! We are the champions, my friend. Well done, well done. All right, good. Let's just get Maddie up. Maddie. Jenna Simitar. Uh, and we had a final cat. Oh, there you are. Maddie, do you want Maddie on the line? for uh, joining us through the last session of today, I think. Um, so we're just going to have a panel session about how to hire, onboard, coach, and develop sales teams. Uh, I'm head of talent at Notion Capital, so uh, this is obviously an area that I'm particularly interested in and particularly interested to hear from these guys. So the first question on my list, um, I think is probably one that you've all come up against, which is when you're in a rapidly scaling business, um, there's usually a pressure from investors like Notion uh, or, or other investors to build your teams quickly, but how do you balance that between building teams quickly and building them really well with high quality candidates? How do you get to find the perfect balance between those two things? Um, I think this probably picks up on some of the points we were making just now. I think just be really, really efficient with your process. Um, firstly, make sure um, that you have a very clear brief um, to the points that you were making just now. Um, I think that's something that Carleen and I really um, focused on. Um, we had an absolute kind of checklist of the must and the kind of wish list items that we were looking for. Um, but we certainly didn't have unnecessary steps in our recruitment process. Um, I mean, you heard me just say, I trust Carleen implicitly. Why would I therefore have a telephone screening um, event unnecessarily? I'd much rather just move straight to an on-site. So that's really helped us to reduce um, that time. Um, and then I think a previous speaker um, touched on this, um, just recruiting with conviction. Um, if you have any doubts, um, you know, and, and, and my VP, He's always been really, really strong on this point with me. Um, any reservations? And if I say, well, and he's like, oh, move on. 
and, um, and we, we really do do that. We just move on that quickly. So those would be my, my kind of tips. Um, I guess the final point just to make on that is um, don't give in to any pressure. You know, don't just hire somebody because you need that spot um, filled because that is never going to work out well and um, it will slow you down a lot more. It's a lot harder um, to um, sort out a bad hire um, than it is to, you know, hold out for the right hire. And even just to touch on that in terms of uh, kind of across the board within DocuSign, we have that motto that we're never going to compromise on talent. And even if we have to go back to the market again and start again, it really for us is integral that we don't compromise. But even to kind of touch on Jackie's in terms of really driving efficiency, obviously within the sales development department is a very large volume area of recruiting for us and that for us is the talent pool for the rest of the organization and with that obviously we have a high turnover of promotions going into a kind executive but if we look at one initiative that we have that really for us is drove efficiency for for really hiring managers time is that we implemented a, a speed interview session so not to be confused with speed dating but quite similar um, and with that we invite four to five candidates on site um, for one hour and they see four to five different different people from the team or different hiring managers and with that obviously we have four to five different opinions and then at the end obviously we have a wash up session in terms of what we liked, what we didn't like, who was moving forward but also what were the key things that they were looking from that person coming to the, to the on-site interview. Okay sure and from the point of view of having um, pressure to um, hire from seniors or investors, like how, do you, how do you push back on that to make sure you can achieve that quality? Uh, so that was definitely something uh, I felt during my time at, at LinkedIn. Um, the balance between hiring fast and hiring great um, is, is very transparent once you look at the numbers. So, you know, my, my weakest hire did 20% of target, my best did 200% of target. So that speaks for itself. So, so why doesn't everybody hold out just for the best? And, and I think particularly in new business, uh, the structure at LinkedIn at the time was that as a manager of a new business team, you carried quota while the role was empty. Meanwhile, on account management, not the case. Account managers, well, the accounts are still being looked after by other people. So I think there were some structural problems with the way uh, targets were set up, which put additional layers of pressure, on the, especially on new business, to hire and have somebody in the seat. And that wasn't just the sales leader, it was their boss and their boss and so on. Um, so I think there's, there's possibly something that can be done there to make sure that the whole business is vested in holding out for the very best. Sure. Dimitari gave me a little cheeky smile there. I think you've got something to say on this. Just to, to kind of um, uh, try to put some context around this in terms of numbers, um, uh, the way I see this is you always be hiring with retention in mind and not just to fill in the, um, the, the, the vacancy. Uh, and what I mean by this is um, that getting it wrong and filling the, uh, the vacancy right now, but having someone let go, I don't know, a couple of months from then is costing you a lot of money. So the average cost per hire for a salesperson is over $4,000 US. So every single time you onboard someone, that's costing even more money because a lot of resources are going into training and ramping that person up. Um, in the case, you know, going back to what I was um, talking about earlier, with Stack Overflow, we will fly new hires over to the US office so they can get trained. So if you don't get it right, that's actually costing you a lot of money and you're leaving a lot of revenue on the table. Um, so if you want to push back to your investors, Tom made a great point earlier about unit economics and efficiency. That's how I'll justify it. They're numbers people, they'll understand it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know, Jennifer, you've got um, VC backing as well, so I'm not sure how you uh, strike this balance. Um, we've been very lucky in our... our VCs and our investors trust us, and it's it's not fair to the company to bring in a bad hire. It's not fair to everybody who's going to be dedicating their time to help onboard this person, and it's also not fair to the new hire because if you they've left a job, they potentially turn down other roles that they're more a better fit for. So I would rather wait, and I am carrying an open quota right now, and it's. Um, it's because I'm, I'm looking for a rep right now and I'm not gonna just hire a body to fill it because there's just too much at stake. Sure, um, thanks for that. So I'll, I'll move on. Um, one of the things that's been talked about a lot throughout the day um, is coaching and moving, um, moving people up in the organization. How do you coach people to be leaders from being individual contributors whilst whilst carrying a number as well at the same time, how do you, how do you help them to break away from, from one position into the other? Um, 
that's actually something that, that I want to address. And when I started at Onfito, everybody wanted to be a manager. That was absolutely the next step. And there wasn't the realization that being an individual contributor is in and of itself an awesome career path. And there are people who stay in that for their entire career because the financial incentives are great, you have a lot of autonomy, you have a lot of responsibility, and quite frankly, if you're a great star individual, individual contributor, you have a whole lot more power than your manager because you're the one that's talking to the clients and you're the one that has the viewpoint of what's going on and you're, you're the one that's out on the front lines every day. And so I, I'm really trying to make sure, of course, my reps, you know, they, some of them will move up, but I don't think it's healthy for everybody to have management as their end goal or for that to be encouraged right away because I, I actually have a lot of friends who are in their late 40s um, who have, uh, they, they were in management and they're all going back to being an individual contributor because it's a whole lot less stress. Um, it's more money and a lot more freedom. And quite frankly, that's, in and of itself, and I, I just want to make sure that people understand that that in and of itself is a career path. It's, it's, if, if everybody thinks that that's not, then it, it's really short-sighted. Okay, so it's addressing the need to actually coach people versus not necessarily wanting to do that or needing to do it, that. It's coaching them to be better than themselves. And there, will, there are some who absolutely have management potential and there are some who have management potential who have no interest in managing. <laughs> um, and it's, it's about understanding what's right for that person and for the organization. And it's, I think if you try to coach everybody to become a manager, it, it's, it's a bit short-sighted. And of course, you know, there, there are ones who are naturally going to rise and it's recognizing that and giving them additional development or giving them additional opportunities or different specialized training or specialized coaching but I just don't want a coach to become a manager. Sure, and so how do you um, delineate between those people who've got potential and want to do it and those who either don't want to do it or don't necessarily have a natural fit for it? Um, it well, it's pretty easy to see. I mean, in our, in our pipeline meetings, I kind of oftentimes sit back and let them ask questions of each other. And it's really easy to see who has that natural ability to ask the right questions and challenge and such. And so there are some who are brilliant at it. And there are some who, quite frankly, are brilliant at it, who have absolutely no interest in going into management um, because they really like their job. Um, and they're getting, it's about giving them more and more responsibility. And they're the ones that stand up in front of the company to give presentations. And they're the ones that get all the glory. And it's, they're the ones that are highlighted um, very much so when a deal close, closes. Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, Patrick, I'm going to push that one over to you because I know you've managed big teams yeah. of people with, uh, in, who are individual contributors and leaders. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for, for me, uh, there was a, a culture, uh, not maybe culture is not the right word, but certainly there was a, a, a prevalence at LinkedIn for people taking on side projects. Um, which, which I, I see a lot of benefits uh, to, uh, allows people to uh, get engaged with uh, other teams other than just purely the sales function that which they might uh, typically deal with. Um, but what I didn't see happening with the kind of side projects which everybody was doing was I didn't see anything that was true, truly leadership um, or giving people a chance to get a taste of what it's like to sit at the head of the table and try to run something as simple as a sales meeting. Um, and so I proposed to LinkedIn to do some kind of uh, team lead structure. They didn't like it. I did it anyway. Um, and, uh, and, and off the back of that, it gave people a chance to actually have a platform. Um, now, we did a bit of negotiating with the team as to how much of their time. Some people wanted uh, to do more. They were happy with doing 15, 20% of their time uh, in a leadership role. Others were worried about their targets, so only wanted to do kind of 10% of their time. So there's a, definitely a, a bit of negotiation with the team to agree what was um, appropriate for them. Um, but one of the key things that I came away from that experience with was uh, there used to be this phrase that is, you know, you're promoted by your peers. Uh, and what I uh, twist on that for me is um, some of the people who have leadership potential don't necessarily see it in themselves. And they may not be coming from the top of the sales stack. They may be mid-level performers, but have got leadership qualities. And so at the end of the year, we did a vote from the team as to who had, uh, who was the award for leads and inspires. And it was a member of the team who picked that up, who I don't think ever imagined that she would be the one who would get that vote from her team. But getting the vote from her team gave her the confidence to then go on and pursue leadership as a, as a career path, rather than constantly just trying to become a better and better individual contributor. Um, so that was, that was my journey. Sure, thanks. Um, 
you guys with massive growth, you must have seen lots of that kind of movement from individual contributor to, to leaders. Yeah, so. absolutely. And it's worked out really well for us. Um, we've had, you know, a few people just in my team that have uh, been promoted to become managers. I do, however, 100% agree with everything that you were just saying there. And I've certainly got some rock star AEs that are great individual contributors, but um, would not necessarily make, you know, the best managers. And they're very dedicated to their, their sales career, which is great. Um, but yeah, a few things that we've done on. Um, every new joiner at DocuSign has a mentor um, uh, aligned with them um, and that's been you know fantastic for kind of onboarding and enablement but it's also allowed us to really identify the ones that have really embraced that mentoring role and enjoy it and it's become very much a two-way thing so there's some AEs that spring immediately to mind where I know that they're using that mentoring program um, to develop and refine their coaching um, skills without having any direct reports at the moment so that's worked out really well um, we also have strategic projects so you know there's a few projects that I've identified in the past where I've given them to an, an individual um, and it's been an opportunity for them to work with stakeholders in other departments um, and to come to sales leadership QBRs and present on that project um, I certainly take time with um, some of the more senior members of my team to expose them to aspects of the business that they wouldn't necessarily always see um, and and again, you can see the ones that have got a bright leadership future ahead of them because they're really curious and they really make the most of, of, of those opportunities. Um, and, and then we've got more formal programs that we've done where we've um, run um, courses um, for top performers um, with business schools as well. Um, and that's working really well. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Jim and Tara, Just to wrap up, I think... Uh, Going back to your question, you follow up to Jennifer, by the way, I absolutely second everything you said. I do think management is the career path for everyone. Um, and to, wow. And uh, to, to your point earlier about how, how would you try to recognize a management potential, the, the way we did it back at Stack Overflow would be to look for people who are consciously competent. So knowing, not just being very good at your craft, but actually understanding why, why, why you're good. Uh, and, and having that skill set allows you to then surface those um, attributes in other people instead of just saying, I don't know, I'll just do the work. Uh, and that's very, very important. Couldn't emphasize more on that. Okay, thanks. And I'm going to actually ping this next question straight back to you because I know it's something that you're interested in particularly, which is, um, I think there can be a, a, an accidental culture in sales of people being lone wolves and having their own number and not necessarily being team players. And I know one of the things that you look at a lot is how do you shift that culture from a culture of individual contributors who have their own number into a, a team situation in the way that it's done development with in, in development with like agile and Kanban and that kind of stuff, really everyone everyone owning the target. What what's your take on on how to make that shift? I mean, do we have like an hour? It's it's a long it's a long um it's a long topic. I'll try to give you just some of the, uh, the things that we, we did a Stack Overflow, which is how we scale from 10 to 120 people globally in sales, and some of the things that we're um, trying to introduce in sales organization with Heresy. Um, the idea is very simple. We take a very heretical approach, which is why the company that I run now is called Heresy, to, to sales management, which is to structure and run your sales organization uh, as an engineering team, which sounds crazy at first, but it totally works, and you do build a very cohesive team with shared goals uh, and, and in the long term, at least the Stack Overflow, we completely redesign the DNA of the sales organization. Um, some practical tips to accomplish this. Uh, instead of having a, a very large, like for example, in, in, in here in Europe, we ended up with about 45, 48 salespeople. Um, and instead of having a single sales organization here, 45, 48, I'm sure DocuSign, you guys probably have more than that now, right? Um, instead of having an overblown sales organization like this, we did what programmers do, which is to um, create teams of teams. So you would basically split those 45 individuals into, in our case, it was six teams of roughly 40 um, to, to six people. Each team owns their individual goal, which is tracked on a burn down chart, which is how programmers do it, which kind of gives you an ideal um, uh, understanding, like an instant understanding of how you're tracking against goals. Um, other things that we did, uh, we would basically introduce prints instead of thinking of a monthly forecast, we would basically split the month. Say you had 20 old sales days uh, in a given month. Instead of thinking of, I need to do, let's say, 200K in revenue in those 
um, 20 days, we'll basically say, let's split that 20 days into four sprints of five days each and have mini targets of 50K. And um, at the beginning of each sprint, the team, those smaller teams of five to six individuals who run completely autonomously from sales management will get together and uh, assess their performance in the previous sprints, looking at the burn down charts and trying to extrapolate where they're going to be in the future. And most important of all, talking about what caused the shape of the bear down, what deals closed, and more important of all, why. Why, why did those deals close? Um, how can we basically leverage the collective wisdom of crowds um, that exists in the team and get to share? knowledge within the team. It's a long topic and I can talk your ears off about it. So I want to give everyone a chance to, to have their say. So uh, if, if that's something of interest, just grab me later and we'll chat about it. Um, that's just James giving me just a, a brief warning to wrap up. Um, so uh, yeah, if we could just like have a final comment from each of you, that would be great. Um, final comment is sales is tough, right? I mean, you're basically paid to be told no. You're paid to have a really thick skin. But it's personally, I love it because it, it's really important to realize that we're the people that are really driving the revenue. It's important to recognize that there's a lot of people helping, but we're driving the revenue and getting the right people on board and coaching them and helping them become better is, it's, it's, it's an awesome responsibility. And I use the word awesome in all sense of the word. It's amazing and I'm American, so I can say awesome without sounding sarcastic. Um, it, it's, but it's also a huge responsibility and um, it, it, it's something that, that's, that works best when you have a great team and hiring the right people is, is critical. I think it's just um, underlining a point that we've already made. I think figuring out um, what makes a successful sales individual or sales manager um, within your organisation, because there will be some nuances in every business. Um, so I think figuring that out and then being immovable in your mission to hire somebody that ticks all of those boxes, um, that will enable you to grow uh, quicker. Um, it will enable you to promote from within. Um, it will save a lot of kind of mistakes along the way. Um, and I think to the point earlier, it will allow you to grow the right kind of culture. Those early hires will become, you know, the DNA of the organization. In DocuSign in the US, we have a number of um, uh, VPs, RVPs, SVPs as well that uh, came in to the organization in the very, very early days, all came in as AEs at the same time. Um, and they've just been huge hugely successful and hugely instrumental um, and you know they always talk about it as, as, as that kind of DNA point. So mine will be short and sweet which is don't compromise, never compromise on talent, don't hire for the job description, hire for the future in terms of where they can go in the business. Uh, I think my final thought um, is that uh, I, I feel like culture is one of those phrases that can end up creating a whole bunch of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, diversity of personality and diversity of backgrounds and things like that. So what I mean by that is uh, my two top performers had exactly opposite personalities and didn't really get along, but uh, they were both incredibly successful. Um, and I also find that um, people who sometimes have had incredibly successful early careers don't necessarily carry the fire in the belly that's required for a lifetime in sales. Um, and so I was a big fan of hiring people who'd worked for shit companies and been to rubbish schools and didn't really have the opportunities, um, but yet had fought their way through. Um, so I was always a fan of the underdog, to be honest. So go underdogs. I'll skip my, my turn and turn over to James because I can see he's really eager to give those awards. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the conference. It's been a great day for me at least. So, thanks over to so James. Much, everyone, and thanks, James. Thanks.